primary myelofibrosis is a rare disease, and at least in the community, it doesn't represent a high percentage of their, pa of pa their patients. So it's nice to have a uh, guidelines or from an expert panel to really help provide some clarity over who it should treat and with what. And the NCCN guidelines is new uh, and was very well done. A lot of the guidelines tend to be, you know, more like recipes for therapy, but the NCCN guidelines for the myeloid proliferative uh, neoplasia really took an objective of pattern of trying to stratify patients based on their uh, varying, uh, variety of uh, risk calculations and then try to, uh, in, a, in an organized way, try to give uh, treatment options based on those patients with lower risk disease and or higher risk disease with different you know, algorithms along the way for patients who do not uh, fare as well. And so clearly within the NCCN guidelines, you see within the intermediate one classification that only those patients who are symptomatic should be treated. Other patients should be watched very closely, but patients with higher risk disease, intermediate two or high risk, really should be thought of as having some form of therapy. It's important, again, I cannot emphasize this enough, that younger patients who are appropriate candidates for stem cell transplant should be referred into a transplant consultant, and that will get that patient into the academic center. Most of the patients, unfortunately, are too old uh, for transplant or too ill, and those patients can be treated in the community with appropriate therapy. And all of these decision uh, uh, algorithms are really outlined very nicely in the NCCN guidelines. Primary myelofibrosis uh, uh, is a disease that is JAK mediated. JAK2 mutations, however, are seen in roughly about 40%. So what about the other 60%? Well, they affect the JAK pathway by either having mutations at the receptor through the MIPL, which is the uh, thrombopoietin receptor, or through modifications through the endoplasmic reticulum through the calreticulin mutation. So you have three different mutations, but all affect the JAK-STAT pathway, therefore allowing ruxolitinib, a JAK1, JAK2 inhibitor, to be effective. It's the rare patients who are these triple negative uh, patients, which are rare, uh, that, that may or may not be appropriately treated with ruxolitinib, but the vast majority will have a mutation along the JAK-STAT pathway, and ruxolitinib is appropriate therapy for this. The COMFORT-1 and COMFORT-2 trials, COMFORT-1 randomizing patients between ruxolitinib and placebo, COMFORT-2 randomizing patients between ruxolitinib and best available therapy, both included patients who were JAK mutation positive as well as JAK mutation negative, and the responses were equivalent between the two groups. Again, supporting the fact that even patients who do not have a, a JAK mutation can have benefit from ruxolitinib. What ruxolitinib did on both the COMFORT-1 and COMFORT-2 trials was improve the size of the spleen, that is re reduced significant splenomegaly as measured by physical exam as well as MRI. And most importantly, at least I think it's most importantly, is that patients on both Comfort 1 and Comfort 2 felt better. And this was objectively uh, uh, annotated by uh, having patients fill out the total treatment score. You can calculate what their symptoms were and then follow it over time. And both studies showed that there was a significant improvement in the ruxolitinib randomized patients in Comfort 1 and 2 for uh, the use of ruxolitinib in patients who are having symptomatic myelofibrosis. Right. Ruxolitinib should be initiated in patients with symptomatic splenomegaly regardless of their uh, DIP score or for patients who have an intermediate two or higher DIP score. This is outlined nicely in the new NCCN guidelines, but these patients were included in both the Comfort 1 and Comfort 2 studies. Determining the dose of ruxolitinib is important Initially, patients had to have a platelet count of greater than 100,000, and then the dose of ruxolitinib was dependent upon what their baseline platelet count was, and dose reduction guidelines should the platelet fall. This has been changed over the course of time as more studies have included patients with thrombocytopenia, so now the use of ruxolitinib can be started in patients with as low a platelet count as 50,000. What I usually do is I follow the guidelines. I initiate ruxolitinib depending on the platelet count at baseline, and then if the patient is tolerating it, I will consider up titrating the dose of ruxolitinib in order to maximize the response. Again, the responses that I am trying to look for is reduction in the size of the spleen and improvement in symptoms, not just in what the patient is verbalizing, but improvement in the objective 
symptom score that is, can be determined at baseline through a simple questionnaire and then followed longitudinally. One of the problems with patients with chronic myelofibrosis is anemia. It's actually part of the diagnostic criteria. Patients should all be anemic, and most of them are. Uh, a larger percentage of them will also, not just being anemic, will also require red blood cell transfusions. And this is a problem. So as patients require more and more red blood cell transfusions, uh, and if their erythropoietin level is low, I will uh, augment or initiate an erythropoietin stimulating agent to try and help with that. It has a modicum benefit, but it's something that it can be easily used. Of course, you need to make sure that their iron stores are replete. This is something that needs to be checked periodically uh, to assure that patients haven't had uh, GI blood loss or other uh, uh, issues uh, prior to your visit that may have uh, caused iron deficiency. So assuming a patient is iron replete and their erythropoietin level is less than 500, if their hemoglobin is less than 10, I will often initiate an erythropoietin stimulating agent. It should be noted that one of the principal side effects, at least over the first two to three months, when initiating ruxolitinib is a fall in the hemoglobin. And you can take patients uh, who were not red blood cell transfusion dependent to become red blood cell transfusion dependent. This does not mean the disease is progressing. This does not mean that ruxolitinib is not effective. This is an on-target side effect of ruxolitinib. All erythropoiesis works through a JAK-STAT pathway, so it is not uncommon that initiating a JAK inhibitor is going to cause anemia. And what you need to do is consult, uh, consult the patient to understand that this is expected and that hopefully over the course of the next three to four months, it will become less and less. And as you see, is there's a sudden drop in the hemoglobin over the first 12 weeks that becomes less uh, uh, dramatic uh, with continued therapy. Thrombocytopenia is an another problem that many patients with uh, chronic myelofibrosis will present with. Uh, there's dosing guidelines for initiation of ruxolina based on the baseline platelet count. But if the platelet count falls, and it can, with initiation of ruxolitinib, sometimes you're going to need to reduce the dose and or hold the dose to allow the platelets to recover. In patients with primary myelofibrosis, one of the principal issues is splenic enlargement. One of the treatment goals of ruxolitinib is to reduce the size of the spleen, but there are those patients in which ruxolitinib doesn't work or it works, but then the patient loses a response. Unfortunately, there's no FDA-approved uh, treatments for patients, medical therapies for patients who develop disease progression. And these are the patients that I tend to try to put on clinical trials, either by adding another agent to the ruxolitinib or switching to a different uh, JAK inhibitor. And there are many that are in uh, clinical trials as we, uh, as we speak. Uh, for patients who have truly refractory disease, who are young enough, healthy enough, without any uh, significant comorbidities, I will consider uh, splenectomy in those rare patients. Uh, to be honest, I, I rarely uh, initiate splenectomy. I, in the last year, I can think of two cases uh, where I sent to uh, surgery. But you have to have a, uh, a really dedicated surgeon who is talented uh, in terms of removing these, uh, these patients' spleens as patients with symptomatic uh, splen uh, splenomegaly who are refractory to JAK inhibitors. Uh, they typically have complications of their splenectomy that can be as high as 30 percent. So you need to have a talented surgeon. It's a rare uh, time that you need it to consider splenectomy, but it's something that should always be at the back of your mind. More importantly is the role of stem cell transplantation, reserved for younger patients, reserved for healthier patients. And again, this is another thing that needs to be uh, considered for patients who develop uh, progressive disease or any patient with high-risk myelofibrosis based on their DIP score. There are several unmet needs in the treatment paradigm for patients with primary and secondary myelofibrosis. This includes those patients who present with severe thrombocytopenia. One of the problems with uh, JAK inhibitors in general is that they can suppress the platelet count, so that becomes an issue. What happens to patients who progress on standard therapy? That becomes an issue. Uh, these are clearly two unmet needs. Uh, the strategies currently are to add to ruxolitinib. Ruxolitinib has a relatively high bar. It's hard, to, it's hard to beat a drug that works. 
Uh, but there are other uh, JAK inhibitors that are being uh, developed in patients who have ruxolitinib uh, failure or were intolerant of ruxolitinib. Uh, these studies are ongoing. Uh, and uh, combination strategies to add therapies to ruxolitinib. In addition, more supportive care approaches. There are other agents that are being developed for patients with severe anemia to try and improve the anemia that's seen with the disease as well as with the therapy as ruxolitinib causes uh, a reduction in the hemoglobin and many patients will develop transfusion uh, dependence.